Should I have an open mind? I have a friend who tends to entertain certain conspiracy theories. I understand the kind of attraction that these theories can have for people. Once you begin down that rabbit hole, once you've accepted certain premises with which such theories usually begin, premises which don't necessarily seem preposterous at the beginning, well, you can quickly slide down that slope and it can be very difficult to haul yourself out again. It becomes easier to argue away discrepancies and to dismiss evidence and facts than to abandon a position which you've invested a lot of time and energy into. I know how difficult it can be to argue with people who adhere to such theories and it's rarely worth the effort. It's just frustrating if not infuriating. I prefer not to embark on that journey. When I've expressed to such people that I don't want to discuss such things with them, they usually try to argue anyway, and when I still refuse, they often tell me that I should have an open mind. Right, should I though? Should I open my mind to an influx of garbage? There are certain things that I will not open my mind to. I will no more ingest poison with my mind than with my body, if I can help it. Having an open mind does not mean having a mind that's open to anything. If I had an open mind in this sense, I'd have to take seriously QAnon claims that Tom Hanks and Hillary Clinton eat babies. The line has to be drawn somewhere, and I've drawn it on a number of issues. One such issue, for instance, is the moon landings, specifically, of course, the conspiracy theory that, that says these were faked. That's not open to discussion for me. I won't indulge anyone's fantasies. Another is the theory that the Earth is flat. I won't entertain any discussion on that. I also won't entertain any discussion concerning the fact of biological evolution. I'm open to discussing the precise processes, but not the fact itself. I'm sure there are many others. Conspiracy theories proliferate online. One area that I often ask myself about is whether I am open to being persuaded that God actually exists. Would I resist strong evidence in order to hold on to my position about this, or would I be open to this new evidence? I know that there are some strong advocates of atheism out there who say that they're open to being convinced. Some even say they wish it were true that God actually did exist. I take them at their word, but that's not the case for me. This is in fact quite a complicated question, and there are many other questions that would also have to be answered. It depends, first of all, of course, on what you mean by God, and this is far from being a trivial question. What are the minimum requirements for a being to be regarded as a God? Well, let's start with the dictionary definition. Although I call this a definition, it probably isn't definitive, but you have to start somewhere. So the first definition in the Merriam-Webster dictionary is this. God, the supreme or ultimate reality, such as the being perfect in power, wisdom and goodness, who is worshipped, as in Judaism, Christianity, Islam and Hinduism, as creator and ruler of the universe. So this jumps straight into what is basically the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. It includes Hinduism in this list, although I think Hinduism uses the term God in other ways too. This definition wouldn't seem to include belief systems such as the Greco-Roman or Egyptian or Norse systems. None of the beings in those pantheons fulfill all of the criteria listed. So there are certain terms in this definition that are immediately problematic for me. Supreme, ultimate, perfect, worshipped, creator, ruler. At the very least, those terms. I don't think I could be persuaded concerning the existence of any single being that fit all of these criteria. In fact, if this is the God that you're trying to convince me exists, 
you would have to prove each and every one of these attributes to me, one by one. Most people try to prove the existence of a creator, at least in the first instance. But it would not automatically follow from this that this particular creator being had any, let alone all, of these other characteristics. It's not as if you can say to me, OK, so now you believe in the creator, so you must also believe that he is all these other things too. Well, no, not even close. If you prove to me that there is a creator, that doesn't immediately imply that this being is supreme or ultimate, for instance. That being may also have a creator. It doesn't imply that they are perfect in goodness or in any of the other qualities that are listed. It doesn't, in fact, prove that they're God. If, on the other hand, you prove to me the existence of a being of perfect goodness, it doesn't follow that this being is also all-powerful or even the creator and ruler of the universe. There are, I think, good reasons for thinking that it's not possible for any single being to have all of these characteristics. And that is, of course, the source of some of the problems that people have with the very idea of God. Is it actually logically possible for a being to be simultaneously perfect in power and goodness? I think to make this so, you have to do some serious redefining of one or both of these terms. An all-powerful being will sometimes have to make decisions that have very negative outcomes, outcomes that in normal circumstances we would consider bad or evil. The only way around this is to argue that these will result in some ultimate greater good, or that, by definition, everything God does is good anyway. This would clearly not be what we usually call good, though. It's usually the concept of good, I think, that gets compromised in these discussions, rather than the concept of power. Good is redefined in such a way that it no longer resembles what we otherwise call good, and therefore it becomes difficult to argue that this should still be called good. So, there are, I think, internal inconsistencies in this definition. He'll no doubt present arguments that satisfy you in this regard, but they won't satisfy me. You'd have more luck persuading me that a good but not all-powerful God existed. But I assume you wouldn't be ready to concede that. And I also assume you wouldn't be interested in persuading me that a perfectly powerful but less than perfectly good God exists. So what I'm basically saying is this. You have a monumental task before you if you intend to convince me that God, as defined in this particular definition, exists. Your burden of proof is enormous. Even then, I may not be persuaded to worship such a being, at least not in the sense of giving such a being my undivided, undying loyalty and my total, unquestioning obedience. But what about the lesser definition of God in the dictionary? A being or object that is worshipped as having more than natural attributes and powers. Well, I guess this fits the idea of what constitutes a God in, say, the Greek pantheon. I'm sure most of you wouldn't even accept this as an appropriate definition of God, so maybe the argument is moot. That there may exist beings in the universe that have some attributes and powers beyond my own? Sure, that's possible, maybe even likely. More than natural remains problematic for me, though. If I were to encounter such a being, I'd be more inclined to believe that their powers were an expression of natural phenomena or technological developments that were beyond my present understanding, rather than in any way more than natural or supernatural. So, is my mind open to the possibility that God exists? Not very, I have to admit. There's too much you'd have to prove to me. At a lower level, am I open to the idea that this universe may have been created by a being or beings? Yes, yes, I'm open to that, though I would be unlikely to call such beings God or gods, just on the basis of that, anyway. I think it would be interesting to find out, though, whether such a being or beings exist and created this universe we see around us. The kind of proof I'm open to, though, is meeting them in person and having a tour of their lab.